So the digestive system, what is the main function of the digestive system? Absorb nutrients. So one thing is absorbing nutrients. Storing. And what's the other big thing? Getting rid of waste. That's, that's kind of part of the process, but I wouldn't say that as being like the core function. You know, Storing. Re release in, in enzymes to prepare the nutrients to be absorbed, to be able to be absorbed. So yeah, that preparing. So I would say kind of breakdown of your food. You know, and what is food? I mean, food, food or other organisms. Food, you know, this weekend was a turkey or was, you know, plants are living things. Maybe it was a yam or a carrot or something. Basically, there are all these, you know, most of what is food was something that was alive, you know, some plant or some animal. And the molecules in that plant or animal are assembled, you know, in the way to make up that plant or animal. And a big part of our digestive system is basically to dismantle that creature and break it down, you know, basically like kind of into kind of building block molecules. You know, we take what used to be a turkey or a cow or a wheat plant or a carrot or a potato or whatever and turn it into monosaccharides and amino acids and, um, you know, triglycerides and things like that, fatty acids. So that's a big part of what we're going to talk about today. And particularly our lab is going to be all about this part, which is taking the food and kind of basically dismantling it. And then once you've dismantled it, you've got to absorb those nutrients, you know, bring those monosaccharides and fatty acids and you know, amino acids and everything into your body, absorb them into your bloodstream, where you're then going to be able to use them either for energy or use them as building blocks to make parts of yourself. Um, you know, if, you know, just from a pure biology standpoint, it's always, it's almost a little creepy thinking about what life really is. It's like all of these creatures that basically consume other creatures and dismantle their bodies and then repattern those molecules into their own, their own body. So it's just like everything is building themselves and something else comes and eats that. You know, it's, it's kind of a trippy, trippy kind of thing to think about. Um, so we're gonna look at both of these. We're gonna look at breakdown um, talk about absorption, and we'll talk about absorption um, of different kinds of nutrients. Um, absorbing, obviously lipids are going to be trickier to absorb than um, things like, you know, carbohydrates, given that, you know, they're hydrophilic. So um, we'll see some special, special things for absorbing um, absorbing lipids versus absorbing other kinds of other kinds of nutrients. Um, so a little background. Um, actually, before we do that, I, you know, absorb, we should, I'll talk really briefly about nutrients. I and mean, this is something you'll learn more about in a nutrition class, but I think it's worth spending a few moments talking about what is, what do we mean by nutrients, right? And like I said, there are, 
the obvious ones that I've just mentioned, things like carbohydrates, um, proteins, fats. Um, these are um, special among the different nutrients in that they have the um, capacity to um, be broken apart for energy. Um, you know, not always. A lot of times your amino acids you use just to build your own proteins. But any of these here or fats you're using to build your cell membranes and stuff, fatty acids, but these can also be broken down for energy. So other nutrients are things like when we, when we say um, minerals. Minerals are just elements, right? Anything on the periodic table would be a mineral, calcium, potassium, sodium, phosphorus. You know, they're just, they're, they are elements that you need to um, build different parts of your body. Um, vitamins. Vitamins are a little, a little trickier to talk about. So to talk about vitamins, we need to talk about what does it mean to be an essential nutrient. Um, does anyone know what does it mean if to be an essential nutrient? Are there nutrients that must be like acquired through your diet? Exactly. So there are a lot of um, nutrients that your body can just make. Like there are no essential carbohydrates. Any carbohydrate, your we talked about gluconeogenesis. If your body needs sugar and you're not getting any sugar, you can use the stuff you already got to make sugar. So there are no essential carbohydrates. Um, there are a couple of essential um, fatty acids. You know, the alpha linolenic, alpha linoleic, those omega, what is it? Oh, I always forget, omega-3, omega-6, I think, fatty acids. Um, so there are some fatty acids you need to get through your diet to make your cell membranes, make your myelin, make do all the stuff in there. Um, there are also essential um, amino acids to your proteins. There's like 20 amino acids that make up all the proteins in, in the human body. You know, of those, you know, depending where you read, around eight are essential, meaning they need to come from your diet. The other ones you can make from other ones you've already got. But there are eight of these 20 that if you don't get from your diet, you're not going to have the building blocks you need to make the proteins in your body. Um, you know, this actually comes up when people talk about different kinds of food, when people talk about like complete proteins versus incomplete. You know, when something is a complete protein, that's a food that is giving you all the essential, essential, essential um, amino acids that you need. Typically, if you're eating some creature, some organism that's, you know, similar to you, it's going to be complete. Like if you're eating an another animal, if you're eating a turkey or a cow or something, you know, you're, they're made up pretty much of the same stuff you're made up of, and you're going to get all the amino acids you need. If you're eating some life form that's a little more alien, like a plant or something, 
you know, a plant, if you're eating a rice, some rice or eating some wheat or eating beans or whatever, those are what we call incomplete proteins because they have some of the amino acids that are essential, but not all of them. So like if all you ate was wheat, you would have a kwashiorkor, you'd have a horrible form of malnutrition because you wouldn't have all the amino acids you need. Um, how is it possible to be like a vegetarian? Obviously, lots of people are vegetarians and are perfectly healthy. I may be wrong, but I'm, I'm a vegetarian and I mix the proteins. Yeah, exactly. You've got to mix, we call them, there's this idea of complementary proteins. You know, the classic thing is like the rice and beans. Like rice is incomplete. It doesn't have everything you need. Beans in general are incomplete, don't have everything you need. But between both of them together, they do supply everything. So the things that they're missing are different. So this idea of mixing complementary proteins, you can't, you just have to, so you can, get everything you need with a vegetarian diet. You just have to be a little more intentional. If you just want to like eat something and not think about it, then you're better off eating an animal. Um, so, so there are essential amino acids. There are essential fatty acids. And then these the idea of vitamins, whoops. You know, vitamins, these are essential organic, mo essential molecules. Um, they're usually um, we call cofactors, coenzymes. Cofactors and coenzymes, these are things that work with the enzymes in your body to help them catalyze their reactions. So, you know, we talked about enzymes being proteins, but sometimes they need more than just the protein structure to do their job. So these vitamins are, they're essential, meaning you have to get them from your diet and they are going to work with your enzymes, the protein parts of your enzymes in order to catalyze all of your metabolic pathways. So, that's when we talk about vitamins. What you know? Why do you need vitamins? You know, vitamins are the things that are helping run, you know, those metabolic pathways. Um, you know, and if we're putting this all in, the other nutrient that people usually mention is you know water. Water is an essential thing that you need, obviously. Um, so that's. You know, so when we talk about the absorption, we're going to talk about absorbing carbohydrates, amino acids, fats, vitamins, um, minerals, things like that. Um, a lot of it is just going to be through the way that we've already seen of taking things across an epithelium, a transepithelial transport. We saw that at the beginning of the semester, taking glucose across the intestinal lining into the bloodstream. Um, fats obviously are going to be more complicated. Um, and then a lot of these things have additional factors involved um, to make sure you have an efficient absorption of different vitamins and minerals. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, All righty. Now I can go back to here where we had started. So here's like this purse, oh, shoot, let me even. Ah. Well, I need to turn off somebody, I think Emily. Okay. So the digestive system is basically, you know, they talk about someone being like a donut. Um, it's a tube that runs through you. 
you know, kind of starts here, your oral cavity in your mouth, goes down your esophagus. Um, there's different sections that are kind of optimized for different kinds of things, but there'll be the small intestine, the large intestine, finally the anus. Um, this is, we call the GI tract, gastrointestinal tract. It's also called the alimentary canal. You know, so as you're digesting your food, you're, it's never actually inside your body proper, right? You're chewing it up, swallowing it. It's getting broken down in your stomach, in your intestines. And whatever is not useful is coming out the other side. Um, as it's breaking down into those building block molecules, that's when you do the absorption. The absorption will be taking it across the sides of this tube, this GI tract, and bringing it into your body, absorbing it into your bloodstream. So we'll be looking at both of these processes, the kind of digestion as the food goes through the GI tract, as well as this absorption, which is going across the wall of the GI tract to bring the nutrients into your body. Um, in addition to the GI tract, there are also kind of accessory structures, accessory organs, you know, like your salivary glands, your, you know, salivary glands, the pancreas, the liver. So uh, we will look at these as well as we kind of continue on. Um, what else? So let's, let's start with the GI tract. We should talk about some of the details of the GI tract in general. And then what we'll do for the rest of the class is look in detail at what's happening at these different stages of the GI tract, what kind of digest, what kind of breakdown is happening um, and or is absorption. Um, so let's start with GI tract. So it's basically a tube. Um, Things worth paying attention to, there's a mucosa. Mucosa just means the inner lining. It's the thing that has the epithelium. This is the thing where we're gonna have the blood vessels and stuff on the other side when we do our absorption. Um, so we'll be looking at things at the mucosa in particular, when we look at the actual final steps where you absorb the nutrients. Um, there's also a submucosa, which we don't really have to talk about too much right now. Um, I do want to talk about the muscularis externa, which we will talk a little bit more about. Um, there is smooth muscle in the wall of this thing. This is smooth muscle. Um, there's a circular layer here. So that will squeeze the tube tighter. There are also fibers that are going along the length, longitudinal layer. So that lets you kind of pooch out the thing. So you can either squeeze it or you can kind of pooch it out um, together. These are called the muscularis externa.
I don't know. Um, there are two main um, patterns of contraction that you should you should know. Um, when we talk about the main ways that this muscularis externa squeezes and manipulates the food within the tube. Um, if you want to move something along, we have peristalsis. Okay, most of you have heard of this, peristalsis. This is like for propulsion. You know, the classic thing here is like if you've, you have some food inside the tube, like if, particularly if you're in the esophagus that you know your gullet when you're swallowing food this is basically pure peristalsis you know and basically the circular layer will contract on top to kind of squish down we'll kind of pooch out the bottom part which is going to ultimately push this down a little farther so now it's a little further and now we squeeze on top of that and pooch down here and it, so it's just basically it keeps squeezing on top, relaxing on the bottom and moving this thing along the path. That's peristalsis. Um, you know, again, in your esophagus is pure peristalsis, just get the food down to the stomach. Um, obviously though, you've got to have elements of this for the entire way or because ultimately whatever is left over is going to finally make it out to the very end of your GI tract and out your anus. So that's peristalsis for propulsion. And then the other side is segmentation. This is like for mixing. You know, this is you know, you've got food in here. And now instead of squishing in one direction, you're, it's kind of more like a washing machine, like squish down here and pooch here, and then squish down here and pooch here, and just go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And the food in here is just, get, it's not moving in any direction, but it's getting all mixed up as the muscle kind of squishes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. So, you know, this is more what's happening, you know, during the breakdown part. You're going to be mixing your food with all these digestive enzymes and then doing a lot of this mixing to allow for the breakdown to occur. So, and, and like I mentioned, the reality is it's usually some mix. You know, so, you know, as you start the digestive process, it'll be pure peristalsis to get here, but then it's going to be some mix of segmentation, kind of mixing back and forth, but then slowly moving along, and but mixing and moving along and absorbing water and moving it along. So, you know, especially when you get down here, it's, it's, it's not a pure segmentation or peristalsis. It's you know, it's, it's there's they're both they're both playing roles. Um, the other thing in the GI tract that I do want you guys to um, be aware of is the enteric nervous system. So the enteric nervous system, these are um, neurons, these um, ple nerve plexuses, so like kind of neural networks within the wall of the GI tract. So there's, um, so these are nerve plexuses. Um, there's one in between the muscle layers, the myenteric plexus of Auerbach, the submucosal plexus of Meisner. You, know, you don't have to know the name of them, although I'll put them there.
Um, what's really trippy about the enteric nervous system is that it can have a lot of local reflexes that are integrated purely within the walls of the digestive tract. You know, sometimes they call this like the primitive gut brain. Um, so for reflexes, reflexes, there's got to be some kind of stimulus and response. What kind of, what kind of things do you think this enteric nervous system has as possible stimuli? What kind of things is it mon monitoring in your digestive processes? Chemical molecules. Totally. So like it's going to be chemoreceptors. You know, there's going to be chemoreceptors that are going to be looking for the substrates of digestion, like what kind of food is there. So we know what we're dealing with. What do we um, need to break it down? There's going to be chemoreceptors for the breakdown products of digestion. Like how do we know if we're done breaking it down? We got to see that there's an absence of the substrates and the appearance of the products, right? So, you know, so chemoreceptors for like, you know, both the substrates and products of digestion. Um, what other kinds of receptors are you going to have? If you're going to control your digestive processes. Stretch receptors? Yeah, exactly. It's going to be mechanoreceptors. You know, is your stomach stretched out or your intestines stretched out? Um, so stretch receptors are going to be important. So we've got these different receptors that we can use to monitor. And what kind of um, responses? can be triggered by this enteric nervous system. ANS. Now, so this, so remember, this is its own. ANS is part of the central nervous system. So this is part of why this is really trippy is that this is not part of the brain and spinal cord. This is something else. Release of enzymes. Yeah, exactly. So there's going to be both. There's going to be, you know, so response can be like glands. You know, we can trigger glands to release stuff. Um, we can do muscle contraction, right? You can stimulate muscles to squeeze and mix or move things. You can stimulate glands to secrete things. So this enteric nervous system. I kind of made this kind of messy. Um, you can have what are called can have what are called short reflexes. These are contained. contained wholly within the GI tract. So there's a lot of aspects of your digestive processes that don't need your brain whatsoever. You have the stimuli within the digestive tract, the neural networks doing the integration inside the digestive tract, and the response is in the digestive tract. So a short reflex is not using the brain at all. Obviously, your brain, you know, John was talking about ANS. ANS definitely does have control over digestive processes as well. So you can also have what we call long reflexes. These do involve the CNS. So, you know, that, that does exist as well, but it's important to realize that 
there are a lot of important um, reflexes within the digestive tract that don't use the brain at all. So yeah, if it's, if we, initially we were talking about the brain and spinal cord being, and they are the main integration for your, for your, um, your control of your body processes. But this, this ENS, enteric nervous system, does a lot of does a lot of stuff on its own. Um, so there's that. All right. So I think now what we're going to do is just start going from the beginning of the breakdown all the way into uh, all the absorption. Um, and for breakdown, we need to talk about two different aspects of breakdown. You know, I brought a piece of food. Here's like a chocolate biscotti as a piece of food. You know, I'm gonna start the process. So what, you know, with my teeth and everything, what am I doing here? Am I breaking this down into, you know, as, you know, individual molecules right now? No, the small pieces. Right. So I'm kind of yeah, I'm taking this whole thing. I'm kind of fit. So we call this. This is just this kind of physical breakdown. This is like chewing. Um, also, when things get in your stomach, you know, just kind of squishing in your stomach. You know, this physical breakdown is more about breaking things into smaller pieces, increasing surface area, but it's not actually dismantling the food into individual molecules yet. What is the other part of breakdown? A moisture uh, with saliva. Well, so saliva, we could mention saliva, which is made by the salivary glands. We're going to actually see it in our lab today. So there is going to be mucus and water. These help, you know, bind, you know, food into a bolus, right? If I imagine I'm chewing this biscotti and I just try to swallow it with, if I didn't have saliva, it would be I'd choke on dust, right? But instead, a little bit. Hey, uh, <laughs> slippery little ball. It's gonna slide down my gullet. So I've got like the water and mucus to kind of bind. That's what this bowl is. Is like the slippery little ball that then you can swallow more easily. Um, what else does saliva have in it in addition to the mucus? Enzyme. Yeah, it has um... enzymes. Um, so that is the other major type of breakdown. Breakdown, there's this physical breakdown, but then there's also going to be this enzymatic breakdown. Chemical breakdown. So this, this is kind of, this. the beginning is you have to just kind of squish it and break it apart, but then the real getting to individual you know, molecules for you to absorb, that's gonna happen with the use of enzymes that break, break the larger molecules into smaller and smaller molecules. Um, and again, it starts in your mouth. The saliva in particular has something called salivary amylase. 
And amylase is something that breaks starches down. And again, what does this, what is starch at a chemical level? What is starch? Carbohydrates. It's a carbohydrate. And how does it? Have uh, glucose, long it? chains of glucose. Long chains of glucose. You know, the amylases start by breaking apart um, these long chains of glucoses into shorter chains. Um, the final steps of breakdown into individual like monosaccharides, that's not going to happen until we get down into the, into the small intestine. But even in your mouth, as you're chewing up your food, the enzymes in your saliva are starting to break the starch apart into simpler, simpler things. In our lab today, um, you'll get to see, you know, normally it would have been one of your lab mates. Instead, you get to see Becky put a bunch of spit in a tube and see what her spit does when you put it with some starch for a while. Um, obviously, there's going to be more amylase than just in what's going to happen when you swallow that food, what's going to happen to that amylase when it gets down into the pH two of your stomach? It's going to get denatured. It's going to get denatured. Exactly. So this saliva, the salivary amylase is optimized to work at just more no neutral pH like you'd find in your mouth. Once this hits your stomach, it's going to get denatured. It's not going to work anymore. Um, but that doesn't matter because we're going to see there are lots more amylases coming in from the pancreas later on when we get down to the small intestine. So this is just the very beginning of starch breakdown. This isn't, um, this isn't the last word on amylase by any means. Um, you know, in terms of absorption, you know, very little is absorbed here. Although there are blood vessels close, especially like under your tongue. Um, you know, you can absorb things in your mouth across the, just the mucosa of your mouth. And actually sublingual is a way to administer drugs. If you want to get something into your bloodstream faster than swallowing it and waiting for that process, you know, putting a little pill under your tongue and letting it dissolve under your tongue and cross into the bloodstream across the mucosa, which is thin right under there, that's, that's an efficient way to get, get drugs into your system. So, sub, you know, sublingual absorption actually is used. Um, but in general, you know, we're gonna, when, we get to, when we talk about absorption, it's going to be mainly down in the small intestine. You're not really absorbing much of anything in the mouth. It's more about just chewing it up and swallowing it. Um, but again, we will come back to this idea of saliva, the idea of the mucus versus the enzymes, the idea of amylase and what amylase does, how amylase is going to function diff differently in the pH of your mouth versus the pH of your stomach. That's all stuff that you're going to actually be working with when we get to our lab later this morning. So this is an introduction to the digestive journey, but it's also kind of an introduction to um, what you've got to think about when we get into the lab as well. Um, so then, So the oral cavity, what is going to keep, what is going to keep as you swallow your food, what's going to keep the food from going down into your lungs? Epiglottis. Yeah, the epiglottis. Remember the little epiglottis? I didn't even draw it here because we're just going to assume that the epiglottis is there. Um, the other thing I don't think I mentioned 
you know, we know that the oral cavity is ultimately connected as well to the nasal cavity. What keeps your food from coming out your nose? Uvula. Yeah, exactly. So you have like the soft palate in the uvula. So when you are swallowing, the uvula and the soft palate kind of go back to block off the upper, upper um, passageways. So and obviously this can fail, you know, you're laughing and milk comes out your nose or something. So, um, but in general, the food doesn't go up into your nose or down into your lungs because of these little flappy things that help block the passageways. Um, the beginning of swallowing is, is obviously voluntary. You have all these, these pharyngeal constrictor muscles and you're kind of squeezing the food back down into the back of the throat. But once it gets to the top of the esophagus, it's then going to be a kind of automatic reflex with the peristalsis. And the peristalsis is just going to continue squeezing the food and plop it down into the stomach. You know, it takes, you know, uh, somewhere around five seconds or so. from when you start swallowing the food to when it gets down and reaches your stomach. So it doesn't just, you know, obviously it doesn't just fall, right? You could be lying on a, on a chaise lounge and somebody's feeding you grapes and the food still goes down your esophagus and reaches your stomach, right? So it's, it's being actively squished along. Um, if for whatever reason the food gets stuck, and then the wave continues down, but the food is still stuck in here. People have probably felt this before. It's like, ooh, wait, something's wrong. Um, you know, the system will automatically initiate another wave of peristalsis to catch it and continue moving it down. So, so that, so this part of the digestive tract is purely about getting the food down into the stomach. Um, what we're going to talk about now is what happens in the stomach. Then after the stomach, we'll get down into the small intestine. After the small intestine, into the large intestine. Maybe I should. So we're going to be looking at each of these in part in um, in turn. Um, stomach which is gonna be, you know, breakdown of proteins and storage and things like that. Um, small intestine, this is gonna be the real workhorse of the digestive tract. This is where we're gonna have the majority of the breakdown and the majority of the absorption. So we'll spend some time in here. Large intestine is gonna be more about um, kind of reclaiming water. Right, because this whole time you're basically got food mixing up with all these secretions and smushing. It's this big goopy slurry of kind of goo that you're you're working with as you're breaking down your food. And before it leaves the body, you're going to want to reabsorb most of the water. You know, bring the water back into your body, um, or else you're going to dehydrate. It's part of your water balance is. Make sure you know, there's got to be enough moisture in the feces so you can actually squish it and move it along and get it out so you're not constipated. But if you have too much water, you know, that's diarrhea and that's actually dangerous. You start becoming dehydrated and losing water from your system. 
So this large intestine, it's going to do a few things, but at the, you know, its main, its main function is kind of water balance. Try to make sure that you keep, you reabsorb the water from this goo that's been mixing with all these secretions to, as part of the breakdown process. Um, you know, in this process, we'll also meet um, some of the main glands. You'll meet the pancreas. Which is kind of sending um, all sorts of stuff into the small on top of the small intestine. You'll meet the liver and the gallbladder, which is also sending stuff here at the top of the small intestine. Um, in our lab, just like I mentioned, we're going to be looking at the role of saliva and salivary amylase and breaking down, breaking down starches and how different conditions can affect that. Part of our lab is going to be looking at the breakdown of proteins that happen in the stomach and different conditions that can affect that. Part of our lab is going to be looking at the breakdown of fats happening in the small intestine and different conditions that can affect that. So that's part of our lab is gonna tie into the stuff I'm gonna talk about right now. This idea that you're going to these different stages and there's gonna be different um, aspects of breakdown happening and it's gonna be different specialized conditions that are gonna facilitate that breakdown. So let's start with the stomach though. So the esophagus, obviously the gullet taking the food down. Um, this entrance, this part right here, we call this sometimes the cardia, the cardiac sphincter. Sphincter, also the gastroesophageal sphincter. So there is a little sphincter as the food comes down. Uh, hopefully keep it from going back up. Um, if that sphincter is failing and you are actually having, because once you're down in the stomach, you're starting to mix with acids and digestive enzymes. Um, we're gonna talk much more about the environment in the stomach, but the stomach is actually specialized to be able to have all of these acids and digestive enzymes there and not dissolve itself. The esophagus is just covered with um, stratified squamous epithelium, just like you know, the skin inside your mouth. So the esophagus is basically just for moving the food down, but it's not about having this really corrosive environment that the rest of your digestive tract is about. So, you know, people talk about, you know, gastroesophageal reflux disease, um, also known as heartburn. You know, that's if the digesting food in here, again, which is mixed up with acids and digestive enzymes, if that manages to get back up into here, the esophagus is going to hurt. Um, because again, the, this, the mucosa of the esophagus is not designed to deal with uh, those corrosive digestive um, elements. Um, it's called heartburn, be and this is actually called the cardia even, because you know where your esophagus is entering your stomach is right near where your heart is. So it's like you know, heartburn is not your heart burning, it's your esophagus burning, but it's kind of in the same, you know, kind of basic location as your heart is. Um, 
obviously this can be worse if you know if you're like really full it's more likely you're going to squish food back up into there or if you're lying down versus sitting up there's lots of things that can affect this um so actually we should talk about this idea of how does your stomach and the rest of your digestive system for that matter keep from digesting itself right this digestive tract is designed to take animals, mammals, things exactly like you and break them apart into building block molecules, right? So this is something designed to take a cow and turn it into monosaccharides and fatty acids and amino acids. You know, how, how do you stop from just dissolving yourself from the inside? Mucosa in the lining of the stomach. So what, what about that mucosa helps protect it from getting digested by all of this digestive juices? Neutralizing the acids? Um, that's not going to be. In fact, in here, it's inside the stomach. The stomach is around pH 2. Um, it's super acid. That's actually necessary for the stomach to do its job. You know, we're going to, and then when we get to the other parts, we'll neutralize that, but then we're going to make it more alkaline. So you actually have more extreme pHs inside the GI tract compared to normal pH. So we need to protect ourselves despite the um, extremes of pH. I'm sure some people have thought about this. Some of you, some of you have, we've talked about it. I know you've been in my anatomy class, so you know some of this. Does it have to do with the buffer system? No. I forget exactly, but isn't it something becomes activated only when it becomes in the stomach? Yeah, so that's part of it. So part of it is, um, most enzymes, most digestive enzymes, produced in an inactive form. Um, for instance, the, the enzyme that we're gonna see in lab um, pepsin. Pepsin is a protease, something that breaks down proteins in the stomach. Now, for instance, in here we have pepsin. It is, is, is called pepsinogen. When it's created, it's called pepsinogen. And if I, actually, let me kind of draw more of the lining of the stomach. You know, so we have these little cells making pepsinogen. Pepsinogen is not active. It doesn't break apart proteins. Once it hits the really acidic environment, then it is converted into the active pepsin. So when it's being made and when it's traveling up the little gastric pits, it's not active, so it's not going to be actually breaking apart your own flesh. It's not until that little, you know, proenzyme hits this acidic environment that there is a reaction that turns it into the active form of pepsin. So, and this is similar in the other digestive enzymes that we're going to see coming from the pancreas later on as well. Um, so you make them in an inactive form, and then once they're up in the, um, this specialized pH of the lumen, then they become active. So that's one way to protect from digesting yourself is the, the um, enzymes only activate once they are in, a, um, in the appropriate environment. Um, what other ways do we have to protect ourselves from being digested from the inside?
Cell regeneration. So another one is cell regeneration. So the fact is, even under best conditions, the cells are wearing out pretty quick. So we have a constant turnover of the cells making up this mucosa. So there's, so, you know, one thing that is protecting us, how to protect. So producing them in an active form. Another thing is just like a high cell turnover. It's just a high epithelial cell turnover. So the cells that make up the walls here are wearing out and they are constantly being replaced. New cells are migrating up from the protected little pits to replace the ones on the front line. The cells on the front line that have worn out get ejected and actually just end up mixed up with the rest of your food. So you're actually, part of your digestive processes is actually recycling your own parts and pieces that are wearing out. So we have this high cell turnover where the worn out cells are getting ejected for recycling and fresh cells are kind of migrating up from the, these little pits to take on the new role on the front lines here. Um, like when someone has cancer, um, the chemotherapy drugs that target cancer cells, you know, trying to figure out what it makes a cancer cell different from a normal cell one of the things that makes a cancer cell different is high, a very high um, rate of cell division. Um, and, but there are other certain parts of your body do have high rates of cell division. So the chemotherapy drugs that will target cancer cells, you know, they target, you know, the cells in your hair follicle. So you lose your hair. Those are rapidly divided. They also target cells lining your digestive tract. So part of the side effects of these chemotherapy drugs are also a lot of digestive issues messing with your digestive tract. Um, Cause that's another place where you have rapidly dividing cells. In this case, it's, you know, part of this, how do you normally deal with the fact that it's such a corrosive environment and they're designed basically to melt mammals into goo. So you've got to have these things in place to keep yourself intact. Um, and then there's one last thing to, that's going on to protect you from digesting yourself from within. It's usually the one thing that everybody guesses first. It's the protective mucus. Yeah, exactly. Kind of just a thick layer of protective mucus. That would be like number three. You know, so between those three things, between having this protective mucus, between having um, enzymes produced in an inactive form that don't activate until they're in the lumen. Again, lumen just means that inside the hollow place inside there. Um, having a high epithelial cell turnover to actually keep repairing stuff that actually is wearing out on the front lines. You know, you basically keep, you know, keep your food digesting without digesting you. Um, more stuff about the stomach. Again, I kind of was drawing it like there's these little gastric pits. Um, cardia is this kind of area here. This big part here is called the fundus. I should mention it. This part down here is called the pylorus. This down here, this is the pyloric sphincter. 
which is heading into the small intestine. Um, so the stomach, you know, a big part of what the stomach does is just storage. Like this fundus is a big floppy part of the stomach. And as you are swallowing your food, it's kind of just falling in here. And you can like store up to like a, a gallon. So, you know, when you were eating your Thanksgiving feast, you probably noticed that you could just keep eating and eating and feeling really full, but you know, you're not processing that food right away, right? It takes a long time to actually break down that food and turn it into, you know, essential building block molecules. So what you do is you kind of swallow it. Um, it's getting sitting here stored in the stomach. You have probably noticed that this, everyone here is old enough to have barfed and realized like you look at your barf and it's like, oh, I recognize what I ate. Like, oh, there's my chewed up spaghetti or there's like, you know, there's a bunch of rice or whatever, right? When you first swallow the food, it doesn't instantly turn into something else. It's just still is your food sitting there in the stomach waiting to get broken down. Um, you know, we're going to talk about essential functions of the stomach. You know, the stomach is not actually necessary for breakdown, even the, you know, proteins break down in the small intestine. Um, you know, it's convenient. The stomach is convenient. It's nice to be able to eat a big meal and let it slowly digest and slowly in little bits and pieces get funneled down to the rest of the digestive tract. Um, so, but, you know, people get stomach reduction surgeries or stomach stapling and things like that if they're actually trying to, you know, if someone's morbidly obese and they're trying to like lose weight and not eat as much, you can just reduce the ability to store food. So you eat a little bit and you have to just let that process before you eat a little more. Um, that being said, for most of us, the stomach is kind of one of the first big places of um, more major breakdown. There's a lot of muscle in here. Um, the muscle kind of goes up and down and up and down. It kind of needs the food. It squishes up, squishes back down, squishes back up, squishes back down. Um, so this is still kind of mechanical. This is taking what used to be your chewed up spaghetti and now kind of turning it more into a paste. Um, kind of that paste, we give a name called chyme. And while we're kind of smushing the food into the paste, we're also mixing it with both um, um, pepsin, which is a protease. Protease just means something that breaks apart proteins. Again, so this is hacking apart the larger proteins into smaller chains of amino acids. And also mix with hydrochloric acid, HCl. So again, like the pH in the stomach is really low. The pH is around two. Um, part of that is also we're gonna get into next class. That's partly part of your body defenses. Like when you swallow things and they land in your stomach, they hit a really inhospitable environment. It's super acidic down there. So part of having this pH really acidic down there is part of the way your body is keeping itself safe. Um, you know, that low pH also helps denature the proteins, makes it more um, accessible to the pepsin, the protease to break it apart. Um, but like I said, protein breakdown will continue just like starch breakdown continues in the small intestine, protein breakdown continues in the small intestine as well with trypsin and stuff like that. So the stomach isn't essential for breaking down protein, but this is the first place that protein is getting really broken down. 
Um, as the food is getting kneaded and mushed and turned into this white goo, a few mils at a time, you're squirting that into um, the next stages of digestion. Um, so basically you've got the stomach squishing up and down and up and down and up and down. And as the food is turning into white goo and breaking down, like squirt by squirt, you're letting little bits down into the next stages of digestion where there's gonna be the more complete breakdown and ultimately absorption. Um, let me talk very briefly about the gastric pits. So gastric pits are these basically little divots along the walls of the, of the stomach where the dastic juices are kind of coming up from. And then lining the walls of these pits are the gastric glands. The gastric glands that are making all of the um, pepsinogen, making the hydrochloric acid, making other stuff as well, which I'll mention right now. So let's talk briefly about what kind of cells you find in gastric glands. Um, there are chief cells. These are the ones that make the pepsinogen. So, and again, pepsinogen, which is gonna become pepsin in the lumen under the low pH, which is then gonna break down protein. There are parietal cells. These make hydrochloric acid. Um, and they also make something called intrinsic factor. Um, this is needed to absorb vitamin B12. Um, one of the kind of non-intuitive things about the stomach, um, the only essential thing that the stomach does that has to happen for you to stay alive and healthy is make intrinsic factor to allow you to absorb B12. You need B12 for lots of processes. We talked about you need it to make your red blood cells. If you don't have enough B12, you're gonna have pernicious anemia. Um, you know, everything else about the stomach is kind of optional, right? It's nice that it can store food, but like I said, you can just nibble bits at a time and let it percolate down the system. It's nice that it starts with protein breakdown, but protein breakdown happens just fine further down in the small intestine with enzymes from the pancreas. Um, but this is something that only the stomach does. So like people who have like those stomach stapling operations and stuff like that, they have to get additional um, supplements of B12 to stay healthy. Um, so, that, that you should know about. Um, and then the other thing in the gastric glands, so there's chief cells, parietal cells, and three, there's what we call the enteroendocrine cells. Um, let me look at the time. Let me, yeah, let's, let's I'm gonna, we're gonna finish up the stomach and take a break here. Um, but for enteroendocrine cells to make sense, I, I need to I think introduce the idea of endocrine and hormones. So let me briefly introduce the idea of hormones here. So 
digestive system is actually where people first figured out hormones. They were trying to understand how different parts of the digestive tract were coordinating with each other. And they didn't see any connections like, you know, your food gets into the small intestine and the pancreas starts secreting. And it's like, how does it know? How does the pancreas know that there are, that there's food in the small intestine? And they, I think it was in dogs, they cut all the nerve connections, they cut every physical connection they could find between the organs. And yet every time food showed up in the small intestine, the pancreas starts secreting. And they realized that the communication was happening through these signaling molecules that were being transported in the bloodstream. So hormones in general, these are basically signaling molecules Um, and I'll say typically transported by the bloodstream. You know, before today is done, we're going to meet a f you know a, quite a few hormones. Um, they're not the hormones that come from endocrine glands. These are hormones that are. Um, created by your digestive tract to control other aspects of digestion. But, you know, they act just like any other hormone. They're released, absorbed into the bloodstream, and then reach their target through the, through the circulatory system. Now, how does, your, how does the target know that there's a message for it? Receptors. Exactly. Any cell that has the appropriate receptor is going to respond. Just like when we talked about adrenaline. Right? Anything that has the appropriate adrenaline receptor will respond once you dump adrenaline into the bloodstream. Um, so hormones. So a lot of the control of digestive tract is done by hormones. Um, gastric secretion. Um, for the stomach to secrete the pepsin and the acid, this is controlled by something called gastrin. So like these enteroendocrine cells that I was talking about, One of the things they do is actually secrete gastrin, which actually talks to the other cells in the stomach to start secreting the acid and stuff like that. Um, we're going to see lots of other hormonal control in here, but just to, and we don't, we're not going to have the time to go into a whole lot of detail, but I do want you to kind of realize that Hormones are all over the place and are essential in the control of gastric secretion and all of that, and pancreatic secretion. And we're going to see later on the, the gallbladder and all sorts of stuff. Um, let's talk back to gas. Okay, two, oh, two more things, and then we'll leave the stomach. Um, absorption. In general, the stomach is about storage. So I'm going to erase it since you know it's about storage. It's about mechanical and chemical breakdown, that kind of kneading, you know, kneading, K N E A D, like when you're making bread, smushing the food into a paste and mixing it with pepsin to break down proteins. So we've got the protein breakdown, we've got storage. Um, there is very little absorption happening, but there is a little bit that's worth mentioning. Um, for instance, water. Water can be absorbed across the walls of the stomach. So like when you're drinking water, it does, it can just start getting into your body just across the walls of your stomach into your bloodstream. Um, you know, some drugs. 
Like if you take aspirin, it's gonna start going across alcohol, right? If you probably like, you know, if you're doing some tequila shots, you don't have to wait for the, for the alcohol to make it down, further down. It's like you start getting bu your buzz on pretty quick, right? That's because the alcohol can cross the wall of the stomach and get into your bloodstream. So there is a bit of absorption, water, some drugs, but in general, most of the absorption of nutrients are gonna happen further down when we get to the small intestine. Um, so the last thing I'll talk about with the stomach is this idea of gastric secretion with a little, in a little more detail. So gastric secretion, I said is controlled by this release of gastrin, but what is gonna trigger the release of gastrin? Chyme, the process of chyme. So, so one is gonna be, so we can have what's called the gastric phase. So there's gonna be both, um, so one is also stretch, stretch of the stomach. You know, presence of food. So part of the part of it is just kind of what you think. Um, the stomach is stretching. There's food in there. That's going to trigger the release of the gastric juices in order to um, start digesting it. But what's really kind of fun to think about is there's before you get there. That's what's called the cephalic phase. So this is actually two. Cephalic, cephalic means head. This is just thinking about the food. This is, you know, kind of going back to the very first day of class, I talked about feed forward, kind of preparing for an anticipated change. If you are about to eat a yummy meal, the system is already gonna, you know, get, get cracking and start secreting um, the gastric juices, you know, before you even take your first bite because it's about to get there. Um, what's interesting, it only seems to work if you actually have an appetite for the food. If you are, they've got like some gruel they put in front of you and it's like, you got to eat it. It's like, ugh. you know, it's not going to work that way. You've got to actually have kind of a positive anticipation about the meal. Um, you know, the third thing that's going to happen, which we're going to talk about after our break, um, you can actually have, you know, inhibition, you know, from the small intestine. You know, this is if the small intestine is still busy working on the stuff it's got and it says, slow down. I need to, I need more time to finish digesting the stuff you've already squirted down here. Um, please don't squirt more yet. So there are actually, we're gonna talk about some of the hormones that will inhibit gastric emptying. Um, particularly like more fatty foods, things that take you know, fats are harder to break down. So if you're, you know, kind of coming back to this picture here, if you're eating fattier foods and it's taking longer for those fats to break down here in the small intestine, it's gonna actually send a hormonal message back and try to slow down the stomach so the stomach doesn't just keep dogpiling more food when it hasn't finished, the small intestine hasn't finished working on what it's already got. So that's what I mean by the small intestine can inhibit gastric emptying. Um, where did I put it? That was over here. All right, so, so, the, so this, the small intestine releases hormones that tell the stomach to slow down Again, that's again why fatty meals typically make you stay full longer 
because the small intestine is sending messages to the stomach saying, slow down. So your stomach is gonna stay full longer than it would have if you ate something that was processed more quickly. When you say the stomach slows down, do you mean that the gastric secretions are less? Yeah, and the musculature, the musculature as well. Um, you're not squishing and squirting out so much and as fast. Um, what else? Oh, should mention. I talked about gastroesophageal reflux disease or heartburn. Um, the other things that can go wrong is if you break down this protection layer, what do we call it if you actually do start eating away at your stomach lining? An ulcer. It's an ulcer. Um, and you can have peptic ulcers, you can, ha you can have esophageal ulcers, you can have duodenal ulcers, um, you can even have perforating ulcers where the hole goes all the way through the wall. Um, some of the, you know, one of the things that was kind of surprising that people found out was that, you know, the ulcers are often associated with um, this bacteria, H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori. So people used to, like when I was a kid, it was just like stress gives you ulcers. Uh, but now they realize that it's often associated with this bacteria as well. That's making you more, at, um, apt to get the ulcers. So um, antibiotics can help with ulcers. You know, the guy who discovered this, they thought he was kind of ridiculous. And then he did like the critical experiment and drank down some culture broths of this bacteria and all this within days started getting ulcers and stuff. So it was like, see, I told you so. Um, so let's take a break. It's 9.42. All right, so we're going to spend a little bit of time kind of finishing the digestive journey, and then we'll shift gears and start doing the lab. So... All right, so last we left our, our little food. We were kind of coming out of the stomach here. And out this little pyloric sphincter and entering into the small intestine. Um, and there are kind of three main sections of the small intestine. Um, the first part, which is only like, you know, 10 inches long or something, is called the duodenum. This is basically kind of being kind of like a mixing zone. Um, then that's going to feed down into this kind of more major part, the jejunum. which is kind of the main site of both breakdown and absorption. And there's gonna be the ileum, which we'll talk about. And then this is gonna head into the large intestine, which we'll talk about next the colon. Colon, large intestine are just synonyms. Large intestine, aka also known as the colon. So let's start by looking at our food here, which has been breaking down in the stomach, getting smushed, getting mixed with pepsin, proteins breaking down, turning into white goo. And the white goo is now coming into here for the next steps. Um, 
the things that are mixing in here at the duodenum. So and I should mention, you know, just to be super clear, the jejunum, the duodenum, the ileum, these are all just different sections of the small intestine. Again, the small intestine is small because it's kind of more narrow, but it's really long. It's like 20 feet long. It's like this big kind of garden hose coiled up, stuck into your belly. Um, so in addition to the food coming in here, this is also where the pancreas is secreting into here. So let's, let's put the pancreas in our picture now. It's a little pancreatic duct being into here. Um, the pancreas does a few different things. The pancreas is, you know, famous in that it's an endocrine gland and an exocrine gland. You know, we've mentioned a little bit about insulin along the road. We're going to talk more about insulin. The pancreas does make insulin, which is an endocrine hormone. Um, there are specialized little parts of the pancreas that do that. That's not what we're interested in right now. We're interested in the exocrine gland functions of the pancreas, the parts of the pancreas that makes digestive secretions that are going to go down this little duct and feed into the duodenum. So there are two main kinds of secretions made in the pancreas. One, it makes a bicarbonate juice. Um, that bicarbonate juice, you know, is going to neutralize the stomach acid. Um, again, the stuff coming out of the stomach is super acidic. Um, the rest of the digestive tract is actually alkaline. So the small intestine is actually going to be alkaline because we're mixing it up with this bicarbonate juice. Um, the enzymes for the pancreas, I mean, the enzymes that are going to be working here in the small intestine are all optimized to work in an alkaline environment rather than acidic like in the stomach. Um, so pancreas, bicarbonate juice to neutralize the acid, and then basically enzyme juice. And there's enzymes to break down pretty much every kind of, of nutrient. You know, there are going to be amylases, pancreatic amylase, this breaks down starch. There's going to be proteases. And I mentioned the idea of trypsin. Um, basically things that break down proteins. Um, there's going to be pancreatin, which is a lipase, which breaks apart fats. There's going to be nucleases that break down um, nucleic acids. So basically enzymes that are going to be able to break down all the different kinds of stuff you've eaten and to finally get to those essential molecules, I shouldn't say essential, all those kind of individual molecules ultimately. Um, the other thing that's feeding in here, we got to add in the liver. Gallbladder. Um, the liver does lots of things. I'll talk about the liver um, in a little bit to give you a better sense of everything it does. We've already met the liver. We talked about the liver filtering blood. Um, we've talked about the liver uh, making all of the plasma proteins. Um, the liver does lots of things. But for right now, we are going to think about one particular job of the liver, which is making bile. Um, so the liver makes the bile, but then it gets stored and concentrated in the gallbladder. So when you need, when you need to have um, bile, the gallbladder can contract and squirt it into here as well. Um, bile is just an emulsifier. It's basically, if you think about um, 
like the phospholipids, things that have one side that is hydrophobic, one side that's hydrophilic. The gall bladder with its bile gives you the ability to take fats. Like if I have, if normally if let's say I have like just ate a, let's say I had a spoon of olive oil, you know, and even if I smushed it around and broke it up into little bits, before you know it, it's going to be back into a big glob, right? If you take oil and water and you shake it up, it separates really quick. So, and that's not going to be very efficient for breakdown. I have lipases, I have enzymes from the pancreas that break down fats, but if I have lipases, and they can't actually get at most of the fat, they're not gonna be able to be very efficient at breaking down the fat. So like if this is my lipase, it is not really gonna be very efficient because most of the fat is still in just, whoop, I meant to do that in yellow. Most of the fat is still in a big glob. So what, bile does, bile are these little amphipathic molecules. They have kind of a polar side and a non-polar side. So the non-polar side goes near the fat, the polar side goes near the water. That's bad, let me rewrite that. Emulsify basically keeps the little droplets from regrouping. You know, what that means is you have a much more dramatic surface area for the lipases to attack. So you're much more efficient at breaking down the fats. Um, you know, if you get your gallbladder removed, how is that going to af affect your digestion? It'd be more difficult to break down fats in your diet. Exactly. You have to be much more conscientious about um, the fats that you're eating because you're going to be way less efficient at breaking down fats. Um, so you have to be much more conscientious about what you're eating if you don't have a gallbladder. Um, so, so we're adding in bile, which helps emulsify the fats, all the enzymes that break down, light pages break down the fats as well as everything else, as well as, I just erased it, the bicarbonate juice, which is going to help neutralize the acid. Um, it's worth spending a few moments introducing a couple of the hormones that control the secretion from the gallbladder and the pancreas. And like I was mentioning a few moments ago, this was where people first started realizing the role of hormones. They knew that the pancreas and the gallbladder secreted when food entered the small intestine, but they didn't know how does the pancreas and the gallbladder know. And again, they cut all of the connections and still when the food got to the small intestine, the pancreas and the gallbladder start doing their thing. And what they found out was that the small intestine releases hormones that are controlling the secretions from the pancreas and the liver or for the, from the gallbladder. So let me just do that briefly. These are hormones released by the small intestine. Um, one is called secretin. Um, this stimulates bicarbonate secretion by the gall by the pancreas. And this is just bicarbonate. Um, 
what is the stimulus going to be for the secretion of secretin by the, by the small intestine? Acid. Exactly, exactly. When it's low pH in the, in the duodenum there, we need more bicarbonate to neutralize that acid. So secretin is just going to be stimulated by low pH. Um, the other thing, you, you just need to know it as CCK. It's officially called cholecystokinin. And this is what stimulates the release of the bile and the enzyme juice. So gallbladder secretes bile, pancreas secretes enzymes. So this obviously is going to be stimulated by the presence of fats and other foods in the small intestine. So when there's fats and other foods in the small intestine, the small intestine releases CCK. CCK talks to the gallbladder and to the pancreas and says, we need some bile and enzymes to break down this food that's here. This will also inhibit gastric emptying. Basically, the same signal that says we got a lot of food here to break down, we need enzymes and bile, that's also a sign to the stomach, like, please slow down. We're, we've, we've still got stuff to work on before we use, you dump more stuff down here. So that's CCK. There are also other hormones that we're not going to go into in the, because of time. Um, but I just want to give you a sense of the importance of hormones and the control of, of the um, digestive processes. So we talked about gastrin is what's stimulating gastric secretion. Um, secretin and CCK are um, controlling the gallbladder and the pancreas here. So it is important to, to understand that. We're going to talk more about um, hormones next week, but then we're going to be talking more about kind of the endocrine glands, kind of the, the thyroid gland and the adrenal gland, but it's important to remember that hormones are used by lots of different organs. It's not just about the classic endocrine glands. It's also your small intestine, your stomach are releasing hormones. Um, your heart releases hormones, actually. All sorts of things release hormones. Um, so that's the duodenum. The duodenum is kind of mixing in all the digestive juices, enzymes, bile, bicarbonate juice to neutralize the acid. And now we're in the real core of the digestive processes, the jejunum of the small intestine. So this is where we're gonna spend a little bit of time to um, look at how the majority of the breakdown and absorption occur. Um, so let's do that. And I should, let me bring up a picture because picture is gonna be way better than I can describe it really. Um, well, here it is. Um, I'm going to share. So this is this is actually f not from your book. This is from from an anatomy textbook, but it's it's pretty. So this is showing the levels of folding that you end up having in the um, small intestine to increase the surface area. The basic idea, this is supposed to show a bit of the tube. You know, again, about this thickness of a garden hose or something. And then you can see that it's got all of these kind of grooves and ripples. These are called the plique circularis. So those are increasing the 
um, surface area. These you can just see, they look like these kind of baffles in there, if even if you just cut open a intestine. And then if you look at the surface of the lumen, it doesn't look smooth at all. It looks kind of like velvet or terry cloth. That's because the surface is thrown up into all these little finger-like projections called villi. So it looks kind of furry in there. And then if you look at each individual villus, this here is supposed to be one of these, one of these little fingers. It's got the um, simple columnar epithelium making up the actual boundary between the lumen and your body. Those cells have microvilli that totally, um, where they are. Oh, this, this is showing what the plique circularis look like. Um, here you can see it looks kind of furry in there. That's the villi. But then if you, I want to find, it's kind of hard to see the microvilli, but basically on the actual surface of the cells, there are these crazy little folds that you can only see under an electron microscope. And the basic idea is you are going to have a, a surface area about the size of a football field in here to absorb nutrients. Um, you know, we talked about, when we talked about, you know, rate of diffusion, we talked about surface area being important. So the more surface area that you have to bring things across, the more efficient you are gonna be at absorbing stuff. So I just kind of want, you know, you don't need to know the details, but you should know that you've got a crazy surface area inside your intestines here. Um, when you actually look inside an individual villus, you can see inside there are the capillaries where you're actually gonna absorb the um, nutrients into. And then there's also this thing called a lacteal, which is a little lymph capillary. Um, so I'm gonna talk about this in a little bit of detail right now. So I kind of wanted to just do all this Again, this is the lumen of my intestine, the inside of my intestine. This is the epithelial cells that are creating this little finger. Again, there's actually lots of crazy little folds, the microvilli here. And then inside here are the capillaries. And as well as the lacteal, which is a lymph capillary. So the, these epithelial cells that have their tiny little folds, these microvilli get the name the brush border. Um, brush border because it looks kind of like, you know, that kind of irregular end of a brush. Um, this has brush border enzymes anchored onto the cells. Um, if you remember back from the first weeks of class when we talked about membrane proteins. I said sometimes membrane proteins are enzymes. If, if it makes sense to have the reaction catalyzed right near the cell, you want to anchor the enzyme right near the cell. So these brush border enzymes, these are the dudes that do the very final stages of breakdown. These are the things that break down the food into the individual monosaccharides or individual um, amino acids, for instance, because this is where we want, remember, this goes back to the beginning of the semester. Um, absorbing sugars, you already know, we don't have to go over it. It's transepithelial transport. It's, it was on your first exam. It was where you had the sugar molecule, and then you had that coporter that brought in the glucose along with sodium. 
you know, through secondary active transport. And then we had a glucose um, carrier. So the glucose comes out the other side and then can get absorbed into your bloodstream. So absorbing the sugars, the carbohydrates is just transepithelial transport like you've already seen. Absorbing the amino acids is also exactly the same, except you have amino acid carriers instead of glucose carriers. Um, the place where this gets um, tricky is with fats, because obviously fats don't dissolve in water. And in fact, at the end of the digestive process, you've got the little fat breakdown products. And there are bile salts kind of holding them in isolation. But we got to figure out how are we going to get these little dudes into the bloodstream? Um, and so it actually ends up becoming kind of a complicated process. Um, so I have to introduce the lipoproteins to really talk about how the fats are going to end up in the bloodstream. Lipoprotein just means a combination of lipid and protein. Um, there's like a lipid core. And then a protein outer part. You know, the nice thing about this is that this dissolves in water and can carry the lipids around in the bloodstream because you know, it has a hydrophilic um, outer coating, even though the lipid core is hydrophobic, this thing will dissolve and get transported around in your plasma. Um, there are three main kinds of lipoproteins that you should know. There are gonna be LDLs and HDLs. This means low density lipoprotein. high density. These are kind of the main ways of transporting the fats around in your bloodstream. Um, in general, HDLs are kind of taking fats away. LDLs are taking fats in for deposition. You know, when people talk about the good fats and the bad fats when they're doing like a workup of your blood, you know, the HDLs are the good fats because they're the ones that are kind of removing fat rather than just kind of, you know, layering them in around places. Um, although obviously you have to do both of them. The ratio is what's actually important. You know, this is not, it's bad to have too much of the LDLs compared to the HDLs, but you need both because you're constantly moving things in, moving things out. Um, the other lipoprotein, so these, these are just for kind of, basic transporting fats around in your body and through your blood. The other lipoprotein is found specifically for absorbing fats in your digestive tract, in your intestine. And they get the weird name chylomicrons. Um, and the way it's going to work is this. These fat breakdown products kind of saunter up to the cell. The cell then assembles them and makes these chylomicrons, which it spits out on the other side. So now we're going to have little chylomicrons here. So basically the fats got taken up by the cell, got assembled through the metabolic machinery and got spit out the other side and are now sitting inside on this other side as chylomicrons. But it turns out the chylomicrons are too big to get absorbed into a capillary directly. 
Um, so that's where the lacteal comes in, this lymph capillary. We talked about lymph capillaries being much leakier, having the flappy endothelial cells that can take in big things. So these can actually get absorbed into the lacteal. Um, where are they going to end up ultimately? Cisterna chile. So the cisterna chile is the big lymphatic duct that these all drain into, kind of in your thoracic region, or actually abdominal region. And then where does that go? Back to circulation. It, it just ends up in your... Um, venous circulation. Remember, it just dumps into the veins near the vena cava. So the fats do end up in your bloodstream, but through a more indirect route. Rather than getting, like, you know, if you have your sugars, your sugars just get pushed across the membrane through transepithelial transport and absorbed into a capillary. Amino acids cross the membrane through transepithelial transport and go directly into a capillary. The fats, on the other hand, have this more circuitous route. They get assembled into chylomicrons, these little lipoproteins. Those lipoproteins go into a um, lymph capillary. The lymph capillary ultimately drains into your venous circulation. So it is now in your bloodstream, but it, it took a few steps. So any questions about that? Again, Professor Chylomicron, sorry to interrupt you. Are are lipoproteins? Yes, these okay. are these are a special part of these are lipoproteins. Whoop. So, and again, this is the main main place where you have both the breakdown happening in the lumen with all of the digestive juices, as well as the lion's share of the absorption that's happening through these processes. All right, continuing on our digestive journey. So we had the stomach duodenum, the jejunum, again. Um, then we get to the ilium. Now the ileum, one of the things that happens in the ileum, you reabsorb bile salts. Right, it, it'd be kind of stupid to just poop them out because you can keep reusing them. So your gallbladder is dumping the bile salts in at the top, but then they're getting reclaimed back down at the bottom. So it, they're not on a one-way trip. They're on kind of this merry-go-round get dumped into the top of the small intestine, get pulled out at the bottom. So the, the bile, bile salts are getting reused. Ilium also has a whole lot of um, um, lymphatic tissue, all those white blood cells I was talking about as part of your um, body defenses. Um, but let's, let's let, the, let the ilium stay there. Um, we now go into the large intestine. The large intestine gets its name because it's um, large diameter. It's kind of like the diameter of your arm, but it's not so long. It actually, it just kind of goes, it goes up. There's an ascending colon, a transverse colon, a descending colon, a little sigmoid colon because you got to bring it into the middle. So, because your, your anus is in the center of your body. 
then there's the rectum, and then there's the anus. This is my colon. Um, like I mentioned, a big thing that the colon is doing is reabsorbing water because all of this process has been mixing all these digestive juices in and smooshing around and so there's this watery goo in there, which you don't want to lose all that water. So we're doing a lot of reabsorbed water here. Um, what happens if you don't reabsorb enough water? Constipation. You get diarrhea. Maybe diarrhea. Ah. Oh. Right. And, and that, and it can be, you know, it's particularly like, you know, kids who have cholera or something. People can die even. It can be life threatening if you just can't stay hydrated. So it actually is, diarrhea is a, is, is something to worry about because it really affects your water balance. Um, what if you reabsorb too much water, Maria? Constipation. Yeah, because then if you pull too much water out of the feces, it starts just turning into a rock, and then you can't keep it moving along. You know, it's part of the reason roughage in your diet is, you know, roughage, which is the, like the cellulose, undigestible parts, is helping keep you regular because it gives the muscle something to kind of push to keep things moving. So you don't just let it sit there and just keep reabsorbing. It also, the roughage is kind of sponge-like, kind of holds on to some of the water. So you need to keep some moisture in your feces or else you're not gonna be able to kind of move it out. Um, one of the things that can happen, you know, you can, you can if it gets really bad, um, so much water gets pulled out that it just becomes like a rock. And then they go in, they call it like, what is it? Um, it's an impacted bowel. They actually kind of have to go in and chip it out to kind of get things moving again. So um, other things in here, there are a bunch of bacteria in here. Um, you know, when you poop, about at least half of the mass of your poop is not waste from your digestive, um, from your food. It's actually bacteria that are living in your intestines. Um, those bacteria do all sorts of things. I mean, one thing they do is they can break down some of the remaining stuff here and make some vitamins. So these can make some, can make some vitamins. Um, I think they make vitamin K, what are, they make, I forget which other ones, um, et cetera. I think some B vitamins, um, which you can then absorb. So in addition to reabsorbing water, you can reabsorb some of the vitamins that are made by these bacteria. Um, the bacteria also in their metabolic processes make gas, you know, flatus. That's one of the things the rectum does. The rectum actually has kind of like a little valve system can, you know, separates flatus from feces. Meaning lets the gas escape without having the poop escape, right? It would be a drag if the gas is building up here and then it wants to come out and you, you know, splatter out poop in the, the process. So the this allows the gas to get out without having the feces get out. Um, the bacteria, I'm not, yeah, I don't, I don't wanna get too deep into it because of time, but we should talk a little bit about this intestinal flora. You know, you've probably heard like you have way more cells in your body that are bacterial cells, non-human cells, and there are human cells. 
Um, these bacteria play pretty critical roles. More and more, we're learning that they're not just kind of there, or they're not like they're making some vitamins and some gas or whatever. Um, if you don't have the appropriate intestinal flora, um, it messes up with your, it messes your immune system. If you don't have the appropriate intestinal flora, it actually messes up with just the development of your nervous system in the first place. Um, you know, these bacteria are making all sorts of stuff that actually end up getting absorbed in your bloodstream and are transported around and interact with your body. Um, there's evidence that the bacteria in your intestines actually influence what kind of food you like to eat. They kind of like adjust your app, like the things that you find compelling to eat to be things that they use as substrates. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of weird. They actually are kind of like, eat this, eat this. And you're like, I don't know why, I think I'm gonna eat that. Um, there's a lot of evidence now that some of these um, diseases can be cured like into these um, digestive disorders can be cured by what they call fecal transplants, by actually putting um, the appropriate population of bacteria into somebody's um, intestines and repopulate it can actually um, stop these like kind of um, debilitating um, autoimmune digestive diseases. They found there was like, not a few years ago, they did this crazy experiment with these rats. Um, they, they had these rats who had identical diets and one rat was skinnier and one rat was more obese. Um, you know, it, it was just, their, their, they were different, their metabolisms were different. They ate exactly the same thing, but one was fatter and one was skinnier. And they swapped their um, bacteria from their intestines and the rats continued eating identical diets and they swapped which one was skinny and which was fat. So it was, it's obvious that these bacteria are playing a critical role in all sorts of metabolic processes in your body, including kind of your set point weight. So these bacteria, again, when I first started teaching this class, it was just kind of like, you know, it's just this thing, like half your poop is just made out of bacteria, but now we're realizing they're playing all these critical roles that we're still understanding. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that there. But yes, yeah, more and more we're learning that there is something you really need to pay attention to when you're thinking about health. Um, all right, we, we're doing okay. We're doing okay. I made myself a schedule and I'm on it. So, the anal canal has sphincters just like we saw with the urethra. There is going to be an internal anal sphincter. An external anal sphincter. The internal one is smooth muscle. The external one is going to be skeletal muscle. Back. You know, and it's going to be the same kind of, it's going to be one of these spinal reflexes that is triggered by stretch. Um, except now, instead of stretch of the bladder, it's going to be stretch of the rectum. As the rectum gets all stretched out as it's filling with feces, that is going to trigger this internal anal sphincter to relax. And then you're gonna feel pressure down here and it's like, I gotta poop. And then you have the external sphincter, which is voluntary. The skeletal muscle is voluntary. So then you obviously can decide, do I want to relax that sphincter right now? Um, you know, and obviously you can help increase pressure here. Remember we talked about the glottis, you can shut down the glottis and you're, um, larynx and bear down, increase the abdominal pressure and try to squish down and make it more likely that you're gonna kind of poop things out. Um, but yeah, this 
this little story here of an internal and external sphincter, you know, triggered by a stretch reflex as here and as feces builds up or in the urinary system as urine builds up. You know, that's it's the same basic story. It's just a stimulus is a stretch. The response is relax the internal smooth muscle sphincter, which results in the urge to defecate or pee. And then you have a voluntary choice to do the external sphincter or not. Um, all right, so the last thing I'm gonna do just for completeness is just talk about the liver for a little, just for a few moments. Um, the liver does so many different things, right? You can live without a stomach except for the B12. You can live without a spleen totally. Your liver is essential. Um, one nice thing about the liver is it's really regenerative. You can lose major chunks of your liver and it'll grow back. Um, in fact, if you're donating your liver to somebody for a liver transplant, you basically get like half your liver cut out and they put it in somebody else and both those half a livers grow back into a full functioning liver. So the liver has amazing regenerative abilities. You know, assuming that you're not really killing it, right? Um, if you're constant, like in alcoholism where you're constantly overwhelming its ability to um, detoxify the alcohol and the cells are constantly stewing in toxins, eventually the liver cells will die and get replaced by fat and connective tissue. That's like cirrhosis. So you can do in your liver, but you got to work at it. In general, if it's like a acute thing, it'll, it'll grow back. Um, what does it do? It does so many things. I just talked about it makes bile. We talked about it makes all your plasma proteins. Except for the antibodies, which we'll talk about being made by lymphocytes, it's making all those proteins involved with clotting, all the angiotensinogen, all of the stuff we're going to see later in the immune system. And there are so, in all the globulins, the alpha globulins, the beta globulins, the albumins, you know, all that stuff is the liver. The liver's making all your plasma proteins. Um, it's filtering your blood, recycling red blood cells. It's got all these white blood cells reaching in and just grabbing stuff out of the sinusoidal capillaries, cleaning stuff up. Um, it detoxifies. It has these enzymatic pathways that you'll learn way more about when you get into pharmacology that basically take different things in your body and start breaking them down so they can get, you know, they can get inactivated and ultimately excreted. So there are all sorts of special enzymes in the liver for detoxifying things, breaking things apart. Um, stores nutrients. You know, it's storing tons of glycogen. So you have a reservoir of carbohydrates. So your blood sugar stays constant. It stores vitamins. Um, so it's got all sorts of stuff to store vitamins and nutrients. Um, interconverts nutrients. You know, I talked about how there's, you know, you don't have a lot of these amino acids are not essential. You know, it's the liver can change it. Or when we talked about lactic acid building up during anaerobic respiration in your muscles, the liver is the thing that's actually converting the lactic acid back into pyruvate or whatever else it needs to get turned into. So the liver has got this kind of crazy chemistry set to do all sorts of metabolic reactions that your body needs to get done. Um, so when you think about the liver, you know, it's 
it doesn't really fit into any one system. It's doing so many different, different things. Um, so yeah, it would be, yeah, we, we couldn't finish the semester without at least giving the liver a nod and giving you a sense of kind of the magnitude of the roles it plays in the body. So liver, 